Greetings, my CEO family. It's Pastor D. Welcome back to another Wednesday in the Word. I'm Pastor D, and I am so grateful that you guys are here with us uh, and joining in with us. Uh, tonight is our last Wednesday in the Word for this series. Uh, this Wednesday will be the last and final Wednesday in the Word for this series, KISS, which is Keep It Super Simple. We have been diving into the parables of Jesus Christ uh, and making it simple. Church isn't meant to be hard. The Bible isn't meant to be difficult but it's all meant for us to be able to understand. And Jesus made it so clear and so plain for us to understand when he taught in parables, he made it very plain. He took some, some everyday situations, everyday life situations to be able to explain to us the spiritual truths of the kingdom of God. So tonight we're gonna to dive into this lesson of the prodigal son, as it is a three parts, but we're gonna deal just with the lost son. We're gonna dive into that tonight. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and, and turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be dealing with this. Uh, also, um, if you need the notes, please type your email in the chat. We're going to get these notes emailed out to you as soon as possible. Amen. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Precious Lord, we come right now asking you, God, to meet us here as you always do. God, your omnipotence, God, meets us in all of our places, even though we may seem as though we're far away. But God, we're interconnected, God, not only by uh, these fiber optic wires and the internet, God, but we're interconnected by your Holy Spirit. Tonight, God, open our hearts that we might see ourselves in the scripture, God. We never want to remove ourselves from your word. But God, we know there is a word in this message for us. So speak, Lord. Speak, God. Speak to me, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and say, say amen. Amen and amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. Let's get this thing going tonight. Let's get this thing going tonight. I uh, hope you've been blessed. Uh, you've been blessed by this message. We we thank God for you uh, and all of you because uh, God is still working. So tonight, here's what I need you to do. Tonight, I need you to type in the chat. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, Lord. So many times we hear the word. We we hear the Bible says we hear the, the man of God get up and preach and we think, oh, man, that, that's a good word for somebody else. <laughs> That's a good word for, for, you know, my son and my daughter. But if you're here right now, God has a word for you. And so uh, we want to make sure that, that you're able to hear God's word. Amen. Amen. In this text, all right, uh, we dive into it. It's Luke chapter 15. And we're going to deal with verses 11 through 20. But we cannot skip past verses 1 and 2. Remember what we said before that understanding the context of the parable is the key to unlocking the parable. Understanding the context of the parable is, uh, is the key to unlocking the parable. It gives us the overall theme of what Jesus was talking about and why Jesus was even speaking the parable. So I want to read uh, verses 1 and 2, which give us the context, and then we're going to go into um, uh, verses 11 through 20. Verse one and two says, now the collectors, the, ta the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Tax collectors at that time were some of what considered some of the worst people to ever be around and uh, because they were always cheating. They were cheating people out of their money. They were uh, uh, disgusting people uh, during that time. And so now all these people were gathering around Jesus to hear what he had to say. So keep that in mind. Let me get to um, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I was set out. And go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. He that had ears to hear, let him hear. We'll, we'll stop right there. So as, as we get into this, we see that the Pharisees were saying, how, how does this man claim to be the son of God? And here he is eating with sinners, known sinners, eating with tax collectors. He's mingling with them. But in the text, Jesus wants to, to let them know that, that there is no differentiation of God's love. Wow, that's a beautiful statement right there. There's no differentiation of God's love. God loves us all. A lot of times we feel like as though, you know, because we're in church that God has a special love for us. But the reality is God loves us all. Even those people that we see on the news, even those people that we see um, that do these heinous crimes, God loves them too. And he starts, he starts talking in parables and he speaks about, uh, he speaks in, uh, tells a trilogy of parables. One about a lost sheep, uh, the shepherd had lost uh, a sheep. He had a hundred and lost one. And he left the 99 to search for that one. And when he found it, he, he rejoiced and brought all of his friends over and they rejoiced for finding that one sheep. There was a woman who had 10 coins and, and she lost one and she, she um, lit a lamp in, in the house and she swept around the house. She searched for this missing coin and after finding it, she also invites over her friends and they rejoice for finding this, this one coin. Then he gets to this last one. And here, here's a difference and a significance. And I want us to make sure that we see it is that um, the, the sheep was lost and the shepherd went after it. The coin was lost and the woman went after it. But now we have a son that is lost. But now we see the father watching and waiting. We see the father watching and waiting. And in this parable, we can truly see the picture that is painted of who God is. We see God being the father. And this wayward child or this, this prodigal son being those who are these tax collectors and those who are the sinners. And then the elders, the elder brother are the Pharisees, the Sadducees the lawmen of that time. And so as we put these things into perspective, now we can understand what, what this parable is truly talking about. And a lot of times we think that when we hear the word prodigal because we've heard this so much, we think that that's somebody that's, that's left and came back. But the word prodigal actually means a, a reckless, extravagant lifestyle. Someone who's wasteful, someone who spends money and, and they're wasteful. They, they live beyond their, their means. And so this son that was there, he, he got weary of being in his father's house. He wanted to leave and he wanted to try his hand and he wanted his own and he was ready for what he wanted. He felt that he was grown. He felt like he knew it all. He felt like I want to be in control. But the first point I would like us to get tonight is, is that there is danger when we leave the father's house. Make sure we get that, write that down. The danger of leaving the father's house because the father's house, let me tell you what the father's house represents. The father's house represents his worship. The father's house represents his word. And the father's house represents his will. And so when we leave the father's house, that's what we're leaving. We're leaving his worship, which is, means being in his presence. We're leaving his word, which is how he speaks to us. And then we leave his will, which is his divine instruction and alignment for our life, his plan for our life. This young man was in the father's house. He had a plan for his life. And now all of a sudden, because he wants to leave, he leaves. And now he leaves structure. He leaves security. He leaves safety. And I, and I ask you this question today. How many of us have left the father's house? How many of us have left his will? How many of us have left his safety? How many of us have left his security? Because here's the thing. If we're not in his word and we're straying off and we're out doing our own thing, are we truly in the father's house? The bad thing is, is sometimes we can be right in the church, but yet and still we are not in the father's house.
because again, the Father's house represents his worship, his word, and his will. And to be in, in, in the building of the church does not necessarily mean that you are in the Father's house. Hallelujah. I hope somebody's hearing me today. This young man was, was, was wasteful, and, and, but, but he gets this urge to want to leave. And he asks for his inheritance. And during this time, what we must understand is to ask for your inheritance while your father was living was absolutely disrespectful because what it meant was, was that you were saying that you wish your father was dead. At that time, the elder son would get two, uh, 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 a double portion of the inheritance. So here it is now, this younger son, he wants his portion, his, his sheep, his lamb, his goats, and, 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 and the property that he was given. And now he cashes it all in to whatever monetary uh, uh, substance or gain that he could get. And now he's ready to get out here and live life to the fullest. Get out here and splurge. Get out here and turn up. Get out here and just do me. Get out here and just uh, 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 have that philosophy of you only live once. I'm ready for the world. And as much as we want to think about our kids, as much as we want to think about you, sometimes it's us. Because watch what he does. He goes to a far away country. Distance. He's separating himself from God. And that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. I look at this young man and, and he's not too much different from, he had the same sin as the original sin that Lucifer had in when, when Lucifer was in heaven. Wanting to be like God, wanting his own, wanting to be in control. And here we see the same sin. And many times what we don't understand is that when we desire our own control and when we desire to be in control, what we're just saying is that we want to be our own God. Oh, hallelujah. And it puts us in a place where we become separated because just like your mom used to tell you, it can only be one parent in this house. So here he is. He separated himself. Because there can only be one God. That governs your life. So now he's wasting his, 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 uh, his money. And he's spending his money recklessly. He's out there splurging. Uh, he, he's having a good time. He, he's, he, uh, his brother later on says he was out there spending money on prostitutes. He's living life and just having this extravagant time. And he got friends. He got people. He got all these people around him. But sometimes let's, let, let's, let's break it down a little closer so it can hit home. He's just out there living beyond his means. Mm. Financially, he's, 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 he's buying things that he shouldn't be buying. He's uh, 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 swiping credit cards. It's just like if, if somebody uh, uh, gave you a credit card and told you that, uh, uh, here, just go spend it. And you just went out and spent it all up and not really thinking about it. You got to pay this back. There's always something that we have to understand that we're going to have to pay back, whether it be with our life or whether it be sometimes it, it can even fall on our children's lives. It's tragedy. We see our sins fall down and they trickle down. And now we see these generational cycles and you can look at your child and say, oh, my God, that's me. But it comes from us. The, 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 so this this squandering is it, it was his fault. That's what I want you to see. The squandering was his fault. The brokenness, his fault. The emptiness, his fault. A lot of times we got to understand that when we are out here in the world and the, the brokenness and the broken hearts and the emptiness that we feel, it's our fault. It's our decisions. So we got to take accountability for knowing that what we have done has placed us in the predicament that we are in. And stop thinking that life is only about you. That's what this young man was doing. He had got to the point where life was only about him. And so the second point is this. We have to beware of famines in far countries. 
This man, he was distant and he had, he had gotten off. And watch this. It said he sold himself into slavery. That's what it says in the, in the text. It's, he said he, he, he sold himself into slavery. He spent everything he had. There was severe famine in the whole country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself. He made himself. Oh, this is good. He made himself a slave to somebody else. When we're out there on our own and when we're living in sin, what we do is, is we make ourselves a slave to sin. And now we don't even control ourselves. Now sin begins to control us and we are no longer in control. Now it can tell us exactly what we are to do. And so here it is. It's this man that he, he connects himself with, tells him what he wants him to do. He says, I need you to go feed the pigs. I need you to go feed the pigs. That's, that's what sin is. Sin, sin grabs us and it enslaves us to the point where now we don't even control ourselves. There was a study um, about um, setbacks and, and, and the things and the hardship that happened in, in people's life. And what it was, it says the, the participants were handed a summary of a person's life. And asked to read it over. And the participants were, were then asked to imagine that this person was their daughter. And this is her unavoidable life story. She hasn't been born yet, but she will soon be born. And, and this is where her life is headed. And the participants have five minutes to edit the story. The erasers in hand. And then they ask them, what, what things would you erase? They start erasing all of the hardship. They start erasing all of the pain. They start erasing the car accident. Erase the hurt. Erase the, addic the addiction. They erase it all to make sure that they their daughter has a smooth, easy life. But I submit to you today, it's not smooth seas that make skillful sailors. But if we're truly honest, sometimes it's those things that we hit, those, those places that we go into, it's those valleys that we're in, it's those circumstances that we can't get out of, it's those, those Red Sea moments that we find ourselves at, it's those Jordan River moments where we look and we have nowhere else to go and the flood and the, and the tide is high and we can't cross and we have no one else to depend on but God. The reality is there's so many people that have came to, to Christ, not because of sermons, not because of books, not because of motivational speakers, but because of circumstances that have hit their life. And so it's almost that situation where we are to sometimes be grateful because these are the situations that can turn us back to God. It's these situations that get us to the point where, where now we are, are understanding who God is. So this young man, he's, he's in this foreign country and, and, and he's hit rock bottom. He's there lying there with the pigs and he's, he's there with the pigs. And, and watch this, he became envious of the pigs. Oh my God. How many of us are envious of people that we shouldn't even be around? Because here we have a Jewish man who is now there feeding pigs. Jew, um, pigs were, were, were considered unclean. They would defile him just touching a pig. And now he is envious of what should be defiling him. Oh, my God. I hope y'all can see this. Envious of what should be defiling. The things that defile you, you're now envious of. Just like somebody that has an addiction. It looks disgusting to somebody on the outside, but to them, it now becomes desirable. And I ask you, where do desires come from? But the desires are, are things that are preloaded and downloaded into us. They're not things that, that just automatically happen. You don't automatically wake up with these things. You don't automatically wake up at, at three years old and say, I want to I wanna smoke crack. These things are downloaded because of our environment, because of our circumstance, because people have told us that we don't look cute. People have told us that we're not pretty. People have told us you don't look like a woman. People have told us things that, that, that have broken us. And now, because it's preloaded and downloaded into us now, this is what a desire sparked from. 
and high desires are, are pushing us to do things that we said that we would never do. And now the desires are making us think that certain things are attractive and they are absolutely defilement to our bodies and to the body of Christ. So we must beware of famines in far countries. And the question is, is are you desiring pig's food today? Are you desiring pig's food? Something that, 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 that we know is absolutely disgusting and that would defile us. And now here we are thirsting and waiting and wanting after it. I want to leave you with this. Write this down. A-H-A. Kyle Adelman writes about uh, A-H-A and the A is for awakening. That's what this, 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 this young man had. He had an awakening. It's the script, scripture says he came to himself. We must have an awakening. When, when sin has corrupted and taken over our life and has enslaved us, we must have an awakening to the point where it alarms us and it sounds the alarm in our life. How many alarms are going off right now in your life that are that are trying to wake you up right now so that you won't be able to oversleep or hit the snooze button on something God is trying to show you in your life. And God is telling you to wake up because the alarm is sounding. Because sometimes God wants to save you from the heartbreak in the distant country. The H stands for honesty. You got to be honest with yourself. So he has this awakening when he says he came to himself and he begins to repent. And now he's honest. He said, uh, 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 my father's servants have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. And watch what he says. He says, I have sinned before God and before my father. But watch this. Always remember this. <coughs> is that we sin before God first. And then before man. We sin before God first. Remember what David said in Psalm 51 and 4. He said, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Awakening, honesty, and the, and the A is for action. It says, so he got up and went to his father. Got to take action. It's not good enough to have the awakening, honestly, but no action. It's not good enough to have the awakening and action and not be honest when we come before the God, before our Father in heaven. So that means we got to submit. You, you see the submission, but submission also requires allegiance. Yes, Lord. Submission requires allegiance. You can't just submit and then don't pledge your allegiance to it. You can't submit and don't play. You got to actually get up and go. I can't just say, I want God. I got to want God. And then I have to show actions to actually show that that's where I am heading. And here's the joy in it. God is waiting on your return. He's waiting on your return. It's the God moment that changes everything. And there he is. I can see him in the distance. This young man was rehearsing his story. This is what I'm going to say. This is what he, you ever got in trouble with your parents? You, ever, you start rehearsing your story? He's rehearsing his story. And before he could even get everything out of his mouth, his father interrupts him, hugs him, kisses him, wraps his arms around him to let him know that he's loved. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. He that had ears to hear, let him hear today. I want to give you these discussion questions that we're going to jump into tonight. And the first one is, why do you think the father would split the inheritance for the youngest? The second is, why do you think the son was so eager to leave? And why are we dissatisfied with the Christian life? What can the famine represent? He desired to eat paws, the pigs ate. How is this like us when we fall into sin? Number four, what was the son's motivation to return? Why do you think that the son thought the father would receive him? 
And then how important is it for us to know God's character? May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. All right, let's dive into this discussion. Amen.